We're throwing off the filters of tradition and culture to discover what the Bible really says about relationships, relationships with God, with ourselves, and with others. Welcome to this episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Welcome, I'm Julie Sedenko, here with relationship expert, Leslie Vernick. As you know, we deal a lot on this podcast with some pretty awful and abusive things. But what if your husband is a great guy 80% of the time? He's a good dad, a good provider, thoughtful, kind, until he's not. Maybe there's episodes of aggress- aggressiveness, yelling, maybe passive aggressiveness, emotionally abusive episodes that can happen in an instant, causing confusion and hurt. Is this an abusive relationship, Leslie? It doesn't happen often. Yeah, these are the hardest ones to discern because um, nobody marries a monster. Nobody nobody stands at the altar and says, you know, I know who you are, but I'm still going to marry you. Um, We believe the best about people and we all have our flaws and our faults and our dark side. So we're married to sinners and we're two sinners trying to put a family together. So this is the first criteria that I would look at is what is his response when he acts like this? You know, is his response blame shifting? Like it's your fault that I lost my temper. It's your fault that I've acted this way. So if he's deflecting that's not a good sign. That's a sign of an unhealthy controlling person versus a healthy person. Because when we mess up, we uh, are called to fess up. It's not like you're going to be married to a perfect person. You never are. But if we look at the Old Testament, there's two really interesting examples of this. So David, um, David is described as a man after God's own heart. He was 80% a good guy. He did some, he did a couple of really bad things. He did a couple of really bad things. He ate yeah. the sacrifices that were supposed to be for the priests, and he sexually assaulted Bathsheba. He probably did a couple other bad things, but I'm going to talk about this thing with Bathsheba. We have been taught that that's been an adulterous affair, but if you really read the scripture, it never says it was a mutual affair. In other words, he summoned her to his bed, and how do you say no to the king? You don't say no to the king. In a patriarchal culture, Abraham sent his wife, Sarah, to the king because he was afraid he would be killed. She didn't say no either. And the king was very upset that he found out she was already married. So you don't say no to the king. And so Bathsheba was discarded after the one night stand. How do we know that? Because we see that she got pregnant and she didn't have this relationship with David in which she could go into his presence and say, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. What are we going to do? She didn't do that. She sent him a note. They didn't have a relationship and he didn't summon her to his room when she sent him the note and say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? He completely ignored Bathsheba. He didn't care about Bathsheba. He didn't care about the pregnancy. What he did do was he summoned her husband back from battle so that he could sleep with her so that he could take responsibility for this child. So David had some bad qualities there, but when Nathan, the prophet confronted David on what he did, he said, David, you know, there was a man who who had a little sheep, and this man had a lot of sheep. He could have taken any one of these sheep, but he took this one sheep for this dinner, and David's going, who was that man? That's a terrible thing he did. And Nathan said to David, David, you are that man. And you know what David did? He owned it. He owned it. At first, he didn't see himself as the selfish greedy person who took that one sheep. But when Nathan confronted him, he owned it. And he said, you know what? I am that man. And then we read in Psalm 51 that he was repentant. But there's another example in the Old Testament, Saul, who was the king before David, he offered a sacrifice that was only to be offered by a priest. And when Samuel, the prophet, confronted him on it, he blame shifted. He said, well, it was the people that that made me do it. They were crying out and I had to do it to please them. And then when, when Samuel confronted him again, he gaslit Samuel and made excuses and danced around the issue. He never, And then he feigned a false apology, but he wanted all kinds of perks. So listen to what happens when you say to your husband, that's not okay the way you treated me last night. That's not okay that you broke my dishes or that's not okay that you called me you know, those names, that's not okay with me. 
ever. That hurts. That hurts our marriage. It hurts my heart. So have you ever talked to him? Have you ever confronted him? Have you ever said, this isn't okay? And what's his response? That would be your first clue. Because if he responds with a, oh my gosh, you're right. That's me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be doing that. Well, then the next step is what are you going to do to not keep doing it? You said it doesn't happen often, but it has happened in a pattern. So I would say you have to find out, hey, if you're sorry that you did this and you don't want to do this again, you better get some anger management. You better get some help. You better get some figuring out how to deal with your temper because you're going to get angry again and I'm going to fail you again. And if you don't get help for this, I'm not going through this again. So this requires a woman to have strong, this is what I will do. This is what I won't do. I love you, but this is not okay. I mean, it would not be okay. If my kid kicked me, Right. One time is too many times, but to do it again and again, even if it was once when he was two and once when he was four and once when he was six and once when he was eight, it's not okay ever. But for me to allow it to continue, even if it's every other year, would mean that I'm not caring enough about my kid to have a strong boundary. It's not okay for you to handle your anger this way. Of course, you're going to get angry. So this is the lie. If I get angry enough, I'm entitled to act as I want. But that's not true. We can get arrested for acting certain ways. Mm -hmm. And the policeman's not going to say, oh, I understand that driver ticked you off. You're you're allowed to crash into his car. He gave you the finger. Okay, well, you can crash into his car then. People aggravate us. People provoke us. Moses himself was provoked by the Israelite sin. And yet God held Moses accountable for Moses' sin. So, So I would say number one is confront him in a good way. Everybody's got stuff. How does he own his stuff? Does he own his stuff or does he blame you? The second thing I would ask is what is the pattern that you're seeing? Like, so the questions that I ask a woman when I'm beginning to see if there's a pattern or the questions that I ask counselors to ask their clients is this, when was the first time that he acted this way? So you've been married, let's, I'm going to make this up. You've been married 20 years. When was the first time he acted this way that he just blew it up? You know, when I'm thinking about this, the first time he acted this way was right after our honeymoon. I, you know, I didn't want to have sex every night anymore. And he just th- threw a fit. Okay. And what happened after that? You know, he did this and he did this and he did this. And then he got over it and he wasn't that anymore, you know, and we we made up. Okay. So so when was the first time on the honeymoon? So they've been married 20 years. Wow. So this started early in their marriage. It didn't just happen like yesterday. This was the first time it ever happened. It never happened before. It happened the first time on the honeymoon, pretty early in the marriage. When was the last time this happened? Yesterday? This week? This month? Was the last time six years ago? When was the last time this happened? Now, the woman who wrote, it happened recently, but if you're listening to this podcast, I want you to ask yourself, when was the first time he hit you or he cursed you out or he slept with another woman or he... Whatever it was, whatever your story is, when was the first time threatened you? When was the last time he threatened you? Third question. And these are not my questions. They come from Lenore Walker, who is an expert in domestic violence. When was the, what's the worst thing that he ever did to you or the children? And oftentimes this is a very humiliating thing. Not the most violent or dangerous, but the worst in your mind is, you know, he forced me to do something sexually I didn't want to do. Or he forced me to get on my knees and beg for forgiveness. It was humiliating. What did he, what's the worst thing he ever did? So the first thing, first time it happened, the last time it happened, what's the worst that's ever happened? And then what's a typical time? Because as you answer these questions, as you're listening to me and answering those questions for yourself, It helps you to see a pattern. And the pattern is this. Did he own it? Did he apologize? Did he take any responsibility for fixing this problem? Or is it all on you? It's your your responsibility to be a perfect wife that never upsets him. And if you could only do that, he would be fine. But that's not possible. You're a human being too. And you've got your own stuff. And so you're never going to make it. And so he's always got an excuse for hurting you. The second thing I want you to notice is is whatever's happening, so the first time to the last time, is it increasing in frequency and intensity? 
So this is what I teach counselors to look for when I'm teaching counselors uh, about abuse. So let's say the first time he screamed in your face. And the worst time was when you had to get on your knees and beg for forgiveness. And the last time was when he had you in a chokehold up against the door. We see that it's increasing in danger for you as we look at those patterns. The first time he just yelled at you, then he's humiliated you, and now he's got you by the neck at the door. This is really important for your safety because if you see the pattern increasing in frequency and intensity over the time, he's not owning it. You're in, a, in an abusive relationship, even if it's infrequent, even if it's infrequent. And so the question then becomes, what do you want to do? What do you want to do about that? It's scary. 80% he's a good guy, but is the good guy the real him? And if it is, if I had something in my life that was causing pain to me and those I loved, the good person in me would get a hold of the bad person in me and say, you need help because I don't want to keep hurting the people I love. So this 80% good guy, is it show? Is it just his image? Because if he doesn't take any ownership for trying to fix it, who is he really? Sometimes, Leslie, women will look at something like that and say, well, you know what? I lose my temper too. I blow up at the kids or uh, at my husband at times too. So maybe is this, is this normal? I, I guess you'd have to ask yourself, not so much normal, but what am I willing to live with? What am I willing to live with? What's healthy for me and my family to live with? Because what's normal isn't necessarily what's good and right. Right. So you might have grown up in a home where it was normal for the F bomb to be used and for you to be called all kinds of names. And that was normal. And so I remember talking to somebody, I just talked with her recently. I met her uh, and I, I was saying, remember when you were so surprised, like you couldn't believe that my husband has never used the B word with me, that you were like totally shocked. She said, I have uh -huh. never, I have never met a man who's never called his wife that name. And I said, well, he's probably thought it a lot of times, but he's never said it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's never said it. And I think he knows I just wouldn't tolerate it at all at all. I, I remember saying to him early in our relationship, I was abused my whole childhood. I will not suffer one more day of abuse in my life. And so he's been, uh, he's never, he's never used that word. Um, and I've never used that word to him either or others, you know, so I think what is normal for you might not be healthy. What was normal for her was, yeah, men lose their temper. They call you names, you're garbage, you're this, you're that, you're, you know, whatever. And then they get over it and you're back to cooking and having you know sex with them. And that's, but you decide whether that's okay with you and you want to be treated that way. I decided even with my children, like, Hey, I'm not going to be talked to that way. So if you want me to listen, you got to change the way you talk to me because I am not listening this to this. So I didn't have to be ugly or abusive to say what I needed to say. So I think you have to decide what's healthy and what kind of environment do you want to be in and what kind of environment do you want to create and what kind of environment do you want to raise your kids in that they see as normal right? Mm -hmm. That they see as normal. So our kids would say they've never seen us do those things because we just didn't do them. And again, it's not that we weren't tempted or that we didn't think, but that's part of the fruit of the spirit is self-control, self-control that we're not going to act out that way. So what is it that you want? And, and does he want the same thing? Or does he want license to do what he wants to do, slip up whenever he's angry and do ugly, hurtful things to you? And then somehow he gets a get out of jail free card because you're a Christian and you have to forgive and forget. Can you? Do you want to? I mean, that's up to you, but you decide. You decide what you want to live with and what you don't want to live with. If he only, if he only has an affair five times in a 25-year marriage, is that too much? I would say, yeah. <laughs> so if he only calls you a B word five times in marriage or hits you, or is that is that too much? So I think you know we have to decide how much is too much. Well, and I think too, if you find that you're the one that's blowing up occasionally and he has a point when he's pointing the finger back in your face, maybe that means that you have some work to do as well. And Absolutely. Like, yeah. And I hope everyone hears me say, we all have work to do. So if you're trying to do your husband's work, how's that going for you? <laughs> you can't do your husband's work. That's why the question becomes golden when you say, 
His problem is his temper. I can't fix his problem. What's my problem with his temper? I don't want to live this way. I feel scared. Our kids are being damaged. I can't sleep. Well, now you know what you need to do about your problem. So I'm going to just say what everybody listening might be thinking right now. Okay, Leslie, what do I do? <laughs> well, there's lots of options. So I think you can, when he starts work. So here's a, here's a real simple example. I worked with a woman who, now her children were grown. Her husband had a terrible temper. He didn't, he, he would, she would say most of the time he's a fine person, but when he gets ugly, he gets vile, like vile and ugly. It just not like yelling loud, but you know, cursing, yelling at her, calling her names, just all. And she just couldn't take it anymore. It was just really affecting her health. So she came home from work. She, we made a safety plan. She packed her suitcase. She was a professional. She packed her suitcase. She made sure she had plenty of cash in her suitcase and she had um, whatever she needed. And her car keys were in the garage in a little, one of those little tins that you can put under the wheel of your car, extra set of car keys. And any other things that she might need for work the next day, if she had to run out without her purse. And she could tell, like she could tell, you you know someone after a while that they're yeah. coming home in a bad mood and it's going to be one of those nights. And she just would, she just decided, I'm not doing this again. So she got in the car. She didn't even tell him. She would just get in the car before, right when he'd come home because she could, t- the vibes were so strong. She knew what was going to happen. She got in the car. She couldn't, t- if it got it, surprised her, she would just get in the car without a purse, but she would just take her purse, walk in the garage, get in the car, open the garage door, pull out. And he's like, you know, doesn't know what she's doing. She called him from the road and said, I could see we were going to have a bad night and I'm not willing to have that anymore with you. I love you and take care of you so that you don't feel so icky. And I'm going to take care of me so I don't have to forgive you. Hmm. And I'm going to um, spend the night somewhere else. I won't be talking to you again. I'm going to turn off my phone and I'll see you tomorrow. And she did that about five times. And he learned that it's pretty boring to have a temper tantrum all by yourself. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. it worked for her. You know, she didn't have to be mean. She didn't have to be ugly. She just said, I can't do this again. I can't, I can't let myself be victimized like this over and over again. So this is, this is where she had some agency. She had some money. She had some ability to do that. Here's another example. Maybe you have small children. You can see daddy's getting worked up. You might say, when I say, you know, Monopoly, we're going to go for a walk and everybody get out the door as fast as quick as possible. And you can just say to him, hey, I know that you're not in a good space right now. Kids and I are going to take a walk or we're going to take a ride and give you a chance to calm down. I don't want to go through what we've gone through when you get like this. So now you're, you're saying, I won't do this. You don't have to say it in a confrontive way. You can say it in a gentle way. See what he does with that. Because either he's going to appreciate that and get a break to calm down, or he's going to grab your hair or something else and tell you you can't leave. Well, now it's much more aggressive. It's much more abusive. And you see what's really going on. And nobody wants to go through that. But but you need to protect and steward you. The Bible tells us that the prudent see danger and take refuge. So develop a safety plan. Do what you need to do, especially if it's only infrequent. You can see when he's getting worked up leave the house for the day, for the night, for however long it takes for him to get control of himself. Yes. Is there anything else that you would want to tell women who are in a relationship with a mostly great guy, but there are these episodes as far as being safe or trying to make it 90% better? (laughs) You know, I think trying to really understand who he is, is he, and is he 90% a great guy in terms of mutuality, reciprocity, honesty, you have the freedom to do what you want to do, or is he charming? So I I really think this is a difference that women have to understand because there's love bombing, yeah, which is also, it just, it's another tactic of a manipulator. So if I'm really nice to you and I fawn on you and give you presents and take you out to dinner and do the dishes and tell you you're beautiful and I'm going to miss you and I I love you so much and I can't live without you. I mean, this tugs on our heartstrings as women. We love that. Um, But it's often manipulative because if if someone does that for you 
and you say, thank you. This is really a nice card. And he says, so can I move home? And you say, no, something else is going to come out of his mouth, right? It's not like, okay, I right. understand. It's going to be, after all I do for you, you still treat me like crap. I can't believe you would do that. You know, and so that's what comes out of their mouth. So if you can stay strong with their no, um, you know, their good side might be love bombing and it might be manipulative or it might be genuine good side. But if there is a good side to him, then I can't believe that the Holy Spirit isn't convicting him of yes. his actions. And so when you say, ouch, how you treated me last night was really hurtful. If he truly is a good guy, then that should bother him. That should bother his conscience. That should that he should be willing to hear you out and work on that. If he's just a charmer and he just wasn't charming last night, but other times he is, understand that this isn't character qualities. This is more manipulation. Um, and it feels much better to have someone be charming toward you than, than malicious, but it's the same person. It's just different sides of the same coin. Or two, I think sometimes they're very charming out in public because it makes them look good. Right. It's and the image really management. just a jerk at home. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that requires the woman to be somewhat discerning. Is it is this who he really is? Or is this his image of who he wants people to think he is? Thank you, Leslie. Do you want to pray? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Lord, there are women who are confused about this, and it's hard to discern what's really in someone's heart. That's not our business. All we can do is look at the fruit of their life. Jesus says it's out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of their mouth when they're upset? What comes out of their mouth when you confront them? What comes out of their mouth when you share the impact of what they've done to you? That shows their heart, Lord. And sometimes we don't want to see it because we don't want to believe that they truly, really don't care about us the way we want them to. It's painful. So Father, I just pray that you would help these women not believe that it's about them. It's not about them at all. It affects them, but it's not about them. It's about their husband's stuff and his sin and his pride or his selfishness or his shame or whatever it is that he's not willing to look at. And we can have compassion for that without keep putting our head back in the snake's basket to bite us over and over again. So Lord, I pray that you would just give women a sense of your care for them when they're in the situation, that you love them. And of course you honor the sanctity of marriage, but not more than their safety and their sanity and their children's safety. And so Lord, I just pray that you would help us be wise as we speak the truth in love. We would not be afraid to speak the truth in love. And as we do so, seeing the results will help us get clear on our next right steps. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Relationship Truth Unfiltered. If you need clarity on whether your marriage is difficult, disappointing, or destructive, go to leslievernick.com forward slash start for Leslie's free quick start guide. It's totally private and will help you get clear on your next step. Again, that's leslievernick.com forward slash start. Until next time, may God bless your relationships with Him, with yourself, and with others.